It is September 18th, 2017. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia with Mr. Bob Irvin um, sitting down with us today for the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program sponsored by the Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you very much for, for being here, Mr. Irvin. Sure, thank you for being here. Very much appreciate it. Um, just to get started, tell us about growing up in and around Atlanta um, yeah. back during your childhood. I grew up in Roswell, uh, which was a town of 2,000 people then, now a town of 100,000 people more. A little, little bit bigger now. Yeah. Uh, my father was a country veterinarian, uh, and uh, as far as I can remember, we had the only Eisenhower stickers, bumper stickers in Roswell in 1956. <laughs> um, but I went to, uh, I graduated from high school at Lovett, uh, and I went to college at William & Mary, uh, and to law school at Emory, and I eventually went to Harvard Business School and got an MBA there. Um, I was, the first thing I ever did in politics was, uh, I circulated petitions in 1963 for Barry Goldwater for president. Uh, I went down to the, uh, to the state draft Goldwater headquarters, which mm -hmm. was in John Savage's dental office <laughs> down on Piedmont Road. Uh, and, you know, what can you do? Well, you know, what they were doing was they were collecting petitions, and the idea was they were doing this all over the country to, you know, send to Senator Goldwater to encourage him to run for president. Sure. And so it was a, it was a I think you had to get 20 on the petition, and you were supposed to, to get a dollar for everybody that signed the, the petition, which... You know, in 1963, a dollar was, you know, not something you just throw around. And so uh, I had to get a dollar for every signature on the petition because this was supposed to show Senator Goldwater that people were actually serious, right? right? They weren't just signing a petition to get rid of you. They were actually serious that they want Senator Goldwater to run. So we, I filled up the petition and we sent it off. And, and uh, so then in, uh, in 64, I actually went to the uh, Fulton County uh, you were in the audience. Mentioned. I was in the audience there. Uh, and um, then I worked uh, a little bit for John Savage that fall mm -hmm. in his congressional race. Uh, and then worked for Jim O'Callaghan, the guy that beat him. Uh, and when I was in college, I was the president of my Young Republican Club. And uh, when I came back to Georgia, I was the state chairman of the Young Republicans. And then I ran for the legislature for the first time in 1972. I was a third year law student. Uh, at Emory. And so I got elected in 72. I was in the legislature from 72 through 78. Uh, then I went to Harvard Business School. Right. Uh, and then I won a special election again in 1993. And so I came back in 93 to the state house and I was the minority leader for six years. Uh, so all told, I was in the legislature 15 years. Okay. So take, let's go back to, to sort of that Goldwater. Um, race, um, you know, you, you said you, you grew up in a family with Eisenhower you know, bumper stickers. Yeah. So you're one of those rare born and bred Republicans yeah. um, down here. Um, what, tell me about the dynamics of, of Republican politics, such as it was in Fulton County. Well, the, I mean, I didn't know anything about Republican politics, and there almost wasn't any, right? I mean, it was, for, for me and for most of the people at that convention, it was all about Goldwater. I mean, the whole the whole point was the the resolution to instruct the the delegates to vote for Goldwater. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know or care about any of the in any of the interparty stuff. Obviously, it had had an effect on sure, what happened. Sure. Uh, and you know, I gradually learned more about it. I got to know John Savage in that effort, and so I helped John Savage, you know, run for Congress. And he didn't get elected, but he eventually did get elected to the state house and so I served with John Savage for uh, six years I guess in the in the state house. So how did you make the decision to to run for um, the state house in 71, 72? Well there was a new district because of reapportionment right. uh, and uh, it was a district that uh, was uh, had a pretty good Republican base in Sandy Springs and, a, and kind of a rural constituency in Roswell and Alpharetta, North Fulton. Uh, and so I was the state chairman of the Young Republicans, and I was encouraging people to run, and so I just decided to run myself. Tell me about the, the your experiences running your first election. How old would you have been when you? I was when I won my the primary. I was twenty three. 
And, and you were running against a Democrat in the general election? Well, there, there was there. It was an open seat because it was right. a new seat, uh, and so I had a Republican primary opponent, and then there was a Democrat uh, in the general election, who was the former chairman of the county commission, a guy named Archie Lindsay. Oh yeah, Archie Lindsay, a very familiar name mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta politics. Yeah. So un, undone by a twenty-three-year-old Republican. And, and yes, and Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> That, which lead, which lead, I, I won. Lead, I won almost three to one. Which leads me into my next question. Yeah. What was what, what was Georgia Republican politics like in seventy two with with an unpopular uh, Democratic nominee in George McGovern? What how aware were you or cognizant of of that the dynamics of the presidential race? Yeah, and the well, down ballot effect. Very much. It was it was it was very interesting. Uh, at the time, because uh, the the critical demographic statewide uh, were uh, Nixon nun voters, and uh, I mean they had just completely abandoned McGovern. Nobody pretended to be for McGovern, and so um, the uh, what I mean the major race for Republicans that year statewide was Fletcher Thompson's race, right. and what Fletcher had hoped to be able to do was ride the the Nixon coattails. Uh, but what in fact happened is, you go back to 1970, it was sort of Jimmy Carter who had, had coined the Georgia Democrat label. You know, right. I'm a Georgia Democrat, I'm not a national Democrat. And that's what Sam Nunn ran as also. And so the, uh, there was just no pretense that, that anybody was for McGovern, uh, any politicians. They were all right. for Nixon, but they were for Nixon and Nunn, not Nixon and Thompson. So you get in, um, you start the term in, in 1973, the, the legislative um, year. Tell me about the Republican caucus, such as it was in 1973. Well, it wasn't really a party. I mean, it was, it was a group of people who had been elected. They were all individually Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they didn't act as a party. They just acted pretty much as individuals. Um, the... The ethos that you get from the Democrats at the time was there are no Democrats and no Republicans down here. We're just, you know, we're all legislators trying to help our communities. And and uh, there's a good side to that. Um, but the bad side is that it doesn't give you any chance to, to grow as a party. And you're a second-class citizen if you're if you're a Republican. Even Democratic uh, members who came in with me, you know, if they'd been there a week, they were subcommittee chairman. And no, no Republican ever got to be a subcommittee chairman. So, uh, but it was, it was very, very much individualistic. And there were really, in those days, there were really two parties in Georgia, not Democrats and Republicans, but rural and urban. Right. And the Republicans were sort of a subset of the urban party. So it was 60% rural, 40% urban, something like that. Who were your leaders in the, in the House? Republican Senate? leaders? Yes. Uh, Mike Egan was the minority leader. Uh, Harry Geisinger was the minority whip. Um, I can't remember the other two. There was a caucus chairman and a secretary. I don't remember who those were. So, you know, you say it's a subset of like the the, the urban uh, party, very much an Atlanta, Metro Atlanta based party. Yes, though we had. I mean, we were Republicans in those days. Were very pleased to get one person elected any place else. So we had uh, had a member from uh, uh, Chatham County. We had a member mm -hmm. from Bibb County. We had uh, a member from Muskogee County, uh, one or two other. We had three members. No, we had two members in 72 from Richmond County. Uh, so we had some others. But yes, it was very much Atlanta-centric and then especially urban county-centric. Right. There used to be a thing uh, in the House called the Urban Caucus. Right, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we were part of the Urban Caucus. So you're talking about each Republican sort of working or, or seeing themselves as an individual Republican or individual legislature. What were the policy goals if there, if there was not necessarily that unity or cohesiveness that you were, you were In the beginning, about? there really weren't any. I mean, the Republicans were, you know, would all have said they were conservatives, uh, but everybody just kind of pursued their own. And, and to the extent there were policy uh, uh, goals, they were those that were, were uh, Urban Caucus policy goals, you know, to get a fair share of education funding and highway funding and, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, tell me about Speaker Murphy um, and, and his, uh, 
his relationship with the Republican caucus. Oh, he hated us. He, Tom Murphy told me one time, he said, I have never knowingly voted for a Republican. Um, and uh, so I, after a while, when I went back in the 90s, I was actually the only person in the Republican caucus who remembered Murphy's predecessor as Speaker, George L. Smith. Um, and you had to call him George L. because the Lieutenant Governor was George, George T. Smith. George T., so that's to, right. You had to use the initial to distinguish him. He was, he was very much of a gentleman. Uh, and he was a, I mean, he wanted to win and stay in control. So he wasn't, you know, uh, uh, and namby-pamby by any means. But, but he was very much of a gentleman. He treated everybody nice. Mm -hmm. And Tom Murphy's style was quite the opposite. Uh, and, you know, he, Murphy would insult you from the, from the speaker's rostrum and, you know, just things that you, you don't have to do and you shouldn't do. So how, uh, how do you and the caucus um, try to change that sort of independent-minded uh, mindset and work towards some level of cohesiveness as, as a caucus during the 1970s? Well, I wrote a paper after the 1974 election uh, really directed at the caucus, more, more broadly at the party, but specifically at the, the House and Senate caucuses. Uh, and the theme of the paper was that we ought to act like a party. Uh, and what that meant was we ought to have uh, a, a program of things that we were for, uh, and then we ought to try to get votes uh, on this uh, and hold the Democrats accountable. Uh, uh, the, the last thing most Democratic members wanted was a voting record. Uh, and so uh, what, we, what we did was we, we did set up a few issues in the 75 and 76 and 77 sessions um, that were intended to, uh, to be, if you will, party identification issues. That is, these are things that the Republicans are for, and if we could get the votes set up, then the Democrats would vote against them, and then you'd have uh, a clear distinction between what the parties stood for. Uh, and you'd also have individual Democratic members on the record as mm -hmm. voting that way, and it was something you could use to run against them because accountability uh, was you know, the thing you had to have to beat any incumbent. You had to hold them accountable for their voting record, and if there was no record, you know, there was nothing to hold them accountable for. What sort of, what sort of issues? The, fir the first one was open meetings. Um, used to be that uh, uh, a lot of uh, committee meetings were uh, held behind closed doors, and so nobody really knew what went on in committee meetings, and, and this was especially true of conference committees. All the conference committee meetings were closed door. Uh, and so we had a, uh, a rule change that we proposed uh, in uh, the first day of the 1975 session to open all committee meetings to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, every single Republican voted for that. And that was the first time, I think, that every Republican had, had voted for anything. <laughs> uh, and so we were able to use that as, as a campaign issue. Some Democrats voted for it, too. Uh, but it lost. Most Democrats voted against it because Tom Murphy wanted them to vote against it. So, so that was the first one, was open meetings. Uh, welfare reform was another one. Uh, we had a, uh, we, we, Bob Beckham from Augusta and I put forward a bill to uh, uh, require that welfare recipients pick up their check in person periodically. I think it was maybe once a quarter, but pick it up in person instead of having it mailed to them. Um, Governor Rockefeller had done this in New York. Governor Reagan had done it in California. It was a big success both places. And so, uh, so uh, we actually got that bill through, through the House. Uh, and it got uh, uh, defeated in the Senate uh, because uh, Zell Miller kind of maneuvered it around to where it would, would lose. He, he had an amendment put on it. Then it had to go to a conference committee. Then he got to appoint the three members of the conference committee. So uh, the majority of the Senate was for it, but it didn't pass because it didn't, couldn't pass the conference committee. But that also was a, was a defining issue, uh, which uh, actually, as it happened, helped Newt Gingrich get elected to Congress in 1978 because it turns out one of the conference committee members who killed the bill, uh, Virginia Shepard, turned out to be his uh, Democratic opponent in 1978. And she was a state senator? She was a state senator state from senator Griffin. Yeah. You, you survived the 1974, the sort of Watergate, Wipeout. Tell, tell me about water, the effect of Watergate on the Republican campaigns 
in Georgia that year. Well, it was devastating. Uh, I mean, it was it was discouraging to Republicans because you know most Republicans you know genuinely supported uh, Nixon. I mean, not every you know iota of his policies, but sure. generally speaking, Republican uh, political leaders and Republican voters uh, supported Nixon. So the um, the it was very stressful in the period leading up to the to the uh, resignation because you had a primary electorate where the majority of your people supported Nixon and a general election electorate where the majority of people opposed Nixon. Right. So if you had a Republican primary that year, it was a real, it was a difficult tightrope to walk. I did not have a primary at a general election. Um, but the uh, it discouraged Republican voters. Uh, Ronnie Thompson being the, the nominee for governor was, you know, in a way even worse than, than Watergate. Uh, but it... Um, it drove down the Republican turnout, drove a lot of people who had been voting Republican back to uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, and uh, one of the things I said in the paper was that what we discovered in the aftermath of the 74 election was that a lot of the voters that since the 60s, since the mid-60s, we had thought of as Republican voters right. actually turned out to be independent voters. And so, you know, the first really bad year that we had, 74, they all went back to the, to the Democrats. So we lost, we lost five seats in the in the House, I think, and uh, maybe three in the Senate. Um, on election night, it looked like we were going to lose five in the Senate. So we had eight going in. Looked like we were going to be down to three, uh, and then there was a recount in one South DeKalb seat, mm -hmm. and uh, we won that one by two votes, I think. And then there was a runoff, uh, if you can believe this, uh, in the North Fulton seat. Uh, Haskey Brantley was the right. <clears throat> Republican nominee, and the Democratic candidate who actually outpolled him on election night was Herb Mabry, who was yeah, yeah. the state president of the AFL-CIO. That's right. You know, if you can believe somebody like that could get elected in North Fulton. So sure. Herb's a nice guy and a local native, but but still, the state president of the AFL-CIO, you wouldn't think would be would run first. He ran first right. on election night, but he didn't get a majority because there was a a, a write-in candidate, and so there was a a uh, a runoff election three weeks later, and Paul Coverdale and I came in and ran Haskey Brantley's campaign for that last three weeks. And but that's the only way we got five. Wow. It was going to be three. Well, tell me about the, your interactions with the state party organization. Um, you know, you, you come in in 1972, um, and you're you're in the in the, the legislature until 78 when you when you leave. How did the party? change over that time? What was your, what was your role in that? Uh, the, the big picture is it became much more professional and much more permanent. Um, when, uh, when I first got elected to the legislature, the state chairman was uh, Bob Shaw. Bob was a good guy. Uh, uh, I hope you interview him. Uh, and he's a good friend. Um, but he inherited a party that, that really had never really been a party. Uh, and so one of the things that, that I thought that we ought to do was we ought to, as a, as a party, we ought to uh, uh, give money and give assistance to legislative candidates because nobody had ever done that. I mean, it, it, you know, everybody raised their own money and, and ran their own local campaigns. And so uh, Paul Coverdell and I uh, founded the Georgia Legislative Political Action Committee, and we got Bob Shaw, bless his heart, gave us $3,000. <laughs> and we distributed that $3,000 to legislative candidates in 1974. <laughs> oh, that was for that, that, every candidate? Oh, yeah, that, oh. Was, for the whole, that okay. was for the whole state. Um, so we distributed that money. Obviously, it didn't make a lot of money in any <laughs> races, but, but, but it was symbolic, right? I mean, sure, the, sure. the state party sure. and the state level was going to take an interest in it. So, um, so then uh, Mac Mattingly became the state chairman in 19... Uh, 75. Uh, uh, I voted for Mac, uh, even though Bob was a good friend. Mac was a good friend too. Mm -hmm. And and Mac's election really, I think, was the critical turning point for the party, because um, <clears throat> he started taking advice from a group that he appointed called the Long Range Planning Committee. That's a title I think he got from IBM. Uh, but um, it was. Uh, Paul Coverdell, Newt Gingrich, uh, John Linder, uh, me, mm -hmm. uh, 
and a few people that uh, that that uh, weren't in elected office. So Bill Amos, mm -hmm. who had been uh, Bo Kelly's campaign right, manager, right. was was on that group. Um, Nora Allen, who was the national committee woman from Columbus, was on the group. It was about seven or eight people, and we met uh, periodically. Probably I, in '75, we probably met five or six times. Uh, and the purpose of that group, as it evolved, was to uh, to help Mac turn this into a real, permanent, issue-focused uh, party. And so we talked about uh, you know what issues we ought to take up, and the general the general theme of it was reform. Uh, and so the decision was that we'd get Mac to campaign all around the state in '76, since we didn't have any any. Uh, statewide uh, right. elections that year, get Mac to go around as the state chairman uh, and to become the face of reform, you know, and to advance these issues, welfare reform and open meetings. I don't remember what the rest of the issue list was, but uh, try to give some, uh, some cohesiveness to Republican campaigns. Uh, and the, the notion of trying to have uh, a statewide list of issues, of having a statewide a group of elected officials who was involved in setting the party policy, creating uh, a donor base, creating a permanent uh, party. I mean, that all happened in uh, originally in sort of that period when Mac was the chairman from 75 to 77. I think that was really the actually the critical time for the growth of the Republican Party in the state. Now, before um, uh, 1975, you have Bo Calloway as sort of an outsized figure in mm -hmm. the party. Tell me about your, what you remember about Bo Calloway um, during that period. Bo was active. Bo was uh, somebody that people looked up to. Bo was a, a, obviously gave you know, his own money to the party and raised other money for the party. Um, he, he, was, he wasn't active day to day. Uh, and uh, you, you, know, you gotta remember the, the times. Uh, he, uh, Bo didn't do much candidate recruitment. Uh, Bo, uh, you know, had opinions which sort of, you know, became party opinions, but they weren't really syndicated as party opinions, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Bo was, um, so I, I, I almost want to use the, the name, the way, the word figurehead. I mean, figurehead sounds like he wasn't doing anything, which is not true. But he was uh, the titularly, titular leader of the party, but but wasn't really doing very much stuff day to day. He never actually did a whole lot of stuff day to day after he ran for governor. Hmm. Okay, so you you decide to step away from politics in nineteen seventy eight. Seventy eight. Um, were you still involved in, in the party or 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 Rodney Cook's sort of pro forma you know, campaign for governor? Yeah. Uh, yes, is the answer. I mean, I was in Massachusetts uh, from. The fall of 78 through the spring of 80. So I wasn't actually here for Rodney's campaign, um, but I was involved in it and I was, I was involved in helping Rodney get, uh, get elected state chairman in the first place. And um, he, uh, I, nobody thought Rodney had a chance to win, sure. but he was, he was running to make sure we had a respectable candidate, right? Because always the danger was you get another Ronnie Thompson, that somebody comes in who, you know, wouldn't be the nominee if there were any competition, but but if there's not, he is, and then he hurts everybody down the And there was that threat the in 70, it was yeah, there Uncle, was. Uncle Bud. I don't or remember who it was, but yeah, there was somebody. And so Rodney, you know, ran really as a, um, as a duty to the party. Now, of course, it was controversial. People said he ought to have to resign as party oh, chairman or sure, for governor. Sure. And somebody said, it may have been Rodney or somebody else said this, that that if he was going to resign as state party chairman in order to run this governor's race, that it would prove that he wasn't smart enough to be either state party chairman <laughs> or governor. <laughs> so no, nobody thought Rodney had a chance. But he did actually do a very important point because uh, Busby was uh, beginning to hint about how he'd be willing to raise taxes. And Rodney seized on that right. and hammered away at it, and Busby backed off. And so uh, Paul Coverdale used to say Rodney Cook saved Georgia a billion dollars or three billion dollars or whatever it was by, by running for governor, by getting Busby to back off the, the uh, 
to take, say it said a different way, getting Busby to say again his pledge that he would not raise taxes. Right. Well, and I think it, you, the fact that Rodney Cook, by 1978, is is the the chairman of the, the state party, that you're supporting Rodney Cook, a person who was at that Fulton County uh, convention back in 1964, side, very <laughs> much on, on the other side, yeah. opposed to gold. So what, what did that say about either Rodney Cook or the party and how they had shifted sort of ideologically or in practice? So what I think happened is that people who served in the legislature together um, came to respect each other and you know, to, to understand problems to some degree the same way. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't know each other, it's easy to have, you know, strongly divergent opinions. Um, the, the realization that I came to uh, early in the legislature was that uh, if somebody was honest and competent, that was enough. I liked them. <laughs> right, I mean, because there were so many people that that were not one or were not both. Right, right? Uh, and so uh, I think people who served in the legislature together, who were honest and competent, kind of found each other, and um, uh, we, you know, we began to see the world in the same way. Okay, so um, tell me about your time out of politics. What what were you doing? I was a management consultant. I'm still a management consultant. But uh, I, I uh, graduated from Harvard Business School in 1980, and I joined McKinsey, and I was at McKinsey for 15 years. Now, were you you absent? For, were you still politically active? Yeah, I would still do party stuff. I went to conventions. I think I went to every state convention between 1964 and 19 and 2002. <laughs> well, there's some pretty pretty interesting and competitive party conventions yeah, there in, in there. So let, let's talk about a little bit about the 19... By the way, that's not something that a lot of legislators did. Okay. Uh, there were probably, uh, I don't know, maybe eight or ten members of the legislature who took an interest in party politics. Uh, a lot didn't. Uh, and... The, you know, their theory was the party can only hurt you. Involvement in the party can only hurt you because you'll make enemies. Sure. And what I always thought was that uh, the party kind of provided the background to all the legislative elections and that it was important uh, to have input into what that background is. Uh, and so, so I was always interested in party politics, uh, in who the state chairman was. Uh, and there were a few others. Paul was, Paul Coverdale was very interested in that. John Linder was interested in it mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, Newt was occasionally interested in it. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of members of the legislature were not at all. I mean, they wouldn't even go to the convention. So uh, let, let's talk about some of those uh, campaigns in the 1980s. Um, we mentioned how 1974 was a disaster with, with, mm -hmm. with Ronnie Thompson. 1978 was a credible campaign by, by Rodney Cook. By 1982, um, State Senator Bob Bell uh, is running. Mm -hmm. uh, were you involved in his campaign yeah, at all? Yeah, I was involved okay. in his campaign. I did some issue work for him and raised some money for him. Um, we all thought Bob had a chance to win. Uh, in the end, it wasn't close, but, but we thought he did because uh, he was a, uh, Bob was a very high quality uh, uh, state senator and very knowledgeable and and uh, straight shooter and and uh, you know a good man and so so we really did think he had a had a chance. This is obviously a hypothetical that we can't possibly answer. Would he have had a better shot at winning had Bogan come out of the the runoff rather than Joe Frank Harris? You know I don't know. Uh, it's um, that's not one of those elections where where uh, a totally unexpected person won and. Where you you realize you would have for sure won if the other guy had had you know not lost the Democratic primary. I mean, it it's not like '66, right? I mean, in '66, sure. I worked for Bo Calloway, and we spent the whole summer learning about Ellis Arnold, and this notion that the Calloway campaign, you know, engineered Lester Maddox's yes. uh, <laughs> nomination is just crazy. I, and you said that in your in your paper, but it is. I mean, there's you know, I didn't know any Calloway people that voted for for Lester Maddox. Uh, and we, you know, we wouldn't have spent the whole summer becoming experts on Ellis Arnold 
if we were going to try to engineer Lester Maddox's nomination. So, you know, would Bo have beaten Ellis Arnold? I think he would. Um, uh, and would, uh, would Fletcher Thompson have beaten David Gambrell? I think he would. Right. Um, but um, to, to say that about 82, I don't think so. I mean, I think the, the Democratic candidates were, were all kind of about even. And I think I'm not sure that Bob would have ended up beating any of them, truthfully, even though we thought so at the time. Right. The major issue, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was sort of corruption, was mm. sort of the flagship issue for the camp. Why was that the issue that, that you settled on as possibly the most salient or useful? Well, I think, you know, in, in picking the issues that we wanted to emphasize, uh, you always had to pick something, number one, that you thought was important public policy and that you were uh, right on and that you had a solution to. Um, you know, you wouldn't pick something just because it might be popular. You'd pick something... Or, or cynical, you know, mm -hmm. you pick something because you thought it was important. Uh, and we all believed, I think Bob believed, that there was uh, a lot of corruption uh, in the state. It's not, you know, in Georgia it was never Louisiana or, you know, Texas or someplace. Illinois. Illinois. Um, <laughs> but particularly at the, uh, at the local level, there was and is uh, a, a good bit of uh, a corruption uh, that the state never really was interested in cleaning up, and so uh, that that I thought was that we all thought was an important issue of governance in the state. Mm -hmm. and, and Joe Frank had uh, a, a couple of things that that he could be tagged for on that. He he and his brother had a uh, it was either an asphalt plant or a concrete plant. I can't remember. I think which. it was con concrete. And yeah. and they did a lot of business with the uh, the state highway department, and um, that can't be a coincidence. Uh, and so. This is the way the Democratic machine ran things. They would, you know, give contracts, no, no big contracts to, to favored people. And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't, didn't know at the time and certainly don't remember the details of the Joe Frank Harris sure. situation. But this was, this was something where you could run on an important issue to the state uh, that you could then link directly to uh, the Democratic candidate you were running against. That was always a problem because... Uh, the Democrats would all the dem individual Democratic legislators would always run away from any problem and say, "Well, I didn't do that." You know? <laughs> so, but this was something that you could tag directly uh, on the Democratic candidate. I forgot to mention Senator Mac Mac Mattingly's mm -hmm. election to the Senate. You were still in Massachusetts. No, I was back by then. You were back. I was back. Were you involved? I mean, you were, you were a supporter of Mattingly in '75. Yeah, were, I was, were you involved? I was involved in the campaign, and um, I remember. Uh, this would have been October, I guess. Uh, there was uh, a big Republican uh, cookout in Roswell, where I lived, where we lived. Uh, and one of the uh, people who was who had who I'd known in, in party politics for years, who worked in elections, Connie Russell, uh, came up to me and she said, "Oh, this is so exciting!" She said, "We've just gotten the latest poll in the Mattingly campaign, and he's running ahead of Reagan in Georgia." And I just looked at her and I said, well, he's got to if he's going to win, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but he, you know, Mac, uh, Mac was a good candidate, worked hard, uh, would not have beaten Talmadge if Talmadge hadn't, hadn't, you know, gotten divorced and turned out to be a crook. Right. Uh, by 86, um, the expectation is that, that, that Senator Manley is going to be reelected. What, what happened in, in 86? Was it just a na the national sort of a referendum on, on you know, the, the, the Reagan administration, a second term you know, drop off? Or? I think there was some of that. I think the Republican uh, uh, campaign for governor, uh, again, hurt. Uh, and this was Guy Davis. This was Guy Davis. Yeah. Uh, Guy was uh, somebody that I'd gone to law school with, so I knew him well. And that Guy's a good guy, but he was not a heavyweight candidate. And the Republican uh, Party had spent all their time trying to keep people out of the governor's race, right? Uh, with the theory on the theory that if there if there wasn't uh, a strong candidate, that the Democratic Party would be uh, disunited, and enough people would vote for Mattingly to get him reelected. In fact, there was a theory that Joe Frank Harris would would endorse Mattingly. That never happened. Uh, but but I think the I think the governor's race hurt. 
Um, and I mean, you know, there's always things that you do in, in office, and I've forgotten what what they were now. But there were there were things that Mac was criticized for. Uh, and you know, when you're an incumbent, you got to be able to defend your record. And there were some things that uh, that he was criticized for. Weich Fowler was a was a good candidate. I mean, I think you said this in your paper. He was a very good retail politician, uh, and uh, I was surprised that he beat uh, Hamilton Jordan and Jack Watson. Uh, they were good candidates, mm -hmm. and uh, but he did, and he was very good at it, and and so I think he just he was. You know, he was a better retail politician than Mac was. Moving up to 1988. Um, Plus, oh. remember, no no Republican had ever been elected statewide before Mac. That right? that, that and, is and, a very fair and, point. And so, and so it wasn't the state had not evolved to the point where it was anywhere close to being even. But it was a very close election. It was a close election, but it was close because there were a lot of Democrats that voted for Mac. Right. Mac, you know, Mac made it close mm -hmm. when when maybe arguably, you know, on the baseline vote, it shouldn't have been close. Right. So by 88, you have Reagan leaving office. Um, and uh, many Georgia Republicans, especially those in the party, uh, had not been aligned with the original, uh, well, not the original back in 76, but mm -hmm. in 1980, the, uh, John Connolly, George H.W. Bush, mm -hmm. uh, Reagan, and I, right. Phil Crane, I believe, um, in 1980. But Howard Baker. Howard Baker, Bob that's Dole. what I have. Right, and by by eighty eight, you've got Bob Dole. I mean, Dole ran eighty also. That's that is true. That is true. I forgot about that. Um, you know how did how did eighty eight sort of divide the party? Not not necessarily divide. How did how did Repu Republican leaders sort themselves in nineteen eighty eight? Well, there were two, uh, if you will, mainstream candidates: uh, Bush and Dole, uh, and most of the people that you had known of. In Republican politics, were for either Bush or Dole, and then there was the Robertson campaign, which uh, brought in people that mostly that nobody had ever heard of. I, I I can't remember anybody that I had known in Republican politics who was a supporter of Pat Robertson. Really, um, I, I you know I just say I can't remember. There may have been, but uh, but most of the people who had been I mean, the, the party had absorbed the Goldwater, uh, right. you know, insurgency. Right. The party had absorbed the Reagan uh, group. And so all of those folks pretty much were for either Bush or for Dole. Were I think you, that there were other candidates. Jack Kemp, didn't Jackie Kemp um, run in 1988? Yeah, Rust, Rusty Paul. I think was, Rusty uh, was for Jackie Kemp. Led, led the, so led I the think the people here. who you would have considered the most conservative would have been for Kemp, not mm -hmm. for Robertson. The Robertson group was a completely new group of people. Were you involved in, in any of the, the sort of, I call it intra-party warfare, but there was the question of the, whether the Robertson supporters were really Republicans at this time. Were you involved in sort of... I, I really wasn't. Well, into the 90s, you know, th there is a very real divide within the party along whether it's the Christian right, or if you want to call mm -hmm. them social or cultural conservatives. Mm -hmm. What's the process of, of reaching out and bringing in, you mentioned absorbing people into the party structure? Well, I think in some ways it's, uh, it's like what happened in the, you were asking about the 70s. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, by the 90s, there's, you know, 50, 60, 70 members of the, of the state house who are Republicans. And I think, you know, they came from all groups. And so I think, by and large, people who served together in the legislature came to appreciate each other and to, to see the world similarly. And mm -hmm. I think that's really what happened. I mean, there were some of the, the if you will, external uh, Pat Robertson people. Brant Frost comes to mind. Just disappeared. I mean, I don't know whatever happened to Brant Frost. He ran for state chairman and finished third or fourth, and mm -hmm. that was it. I never that was heard ninety-five, him again. I believe. Yeah, I never heard it. Never heard from him again. Um, you decide to get back into elective politics. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you ran in nineteen ninety. Mm -hmm. I ran against Dorothy Felton. I was asked by uh, a group in Sandy Springs, including Eva Galambos, to run against Dorothy Felton. Why? Well. Uh, Dorothy uh, and Sally Newbill, mm -hmm. who was the state senator, had come to be enemies. And Sally Newbill had actually passed 
a Sandy Springs Incorporation bill in the Senate, and it um, came over to the House, and Dorothy uh, opposed it quietly because she said there were flaws in it. Maybe there were flaws in it, but the real reason was because it wasn't her bill. <laughs> and so that became, as you might imagine, something that, uh, that became controversial in the, sure. the pro-incorporation group in Sandy Springs. And so, uh, so Eva Galambos and several of the others asked me to run against Dorothy for this reason. So you were unsuccess- You ran a strong campaign in 1990. Lost by 225 votes, I think it was. I would say it stuck with you. <laughs> and, and of course, I mean, of course, Dorothy denied doing this, right? Sure. Oh, sure. But, sure. but I, but I checked it out ahead of time with the relevant people, and she did do it. But she, you know, but it was hard to get people to believe that she did it because she had such a long record of oh, right, promoting right. incorporation. So you, you run again in 1994. 93. 93. Yeah, Mitch Scalakis. Uh, That's right. No. Yeah. This was Kill Townsend's seat. Uh, Kill decided in 92 not to run again. Mitch Scanlakis won the seat. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he decided uh, in the fall of 93 to uh, run for Fulton County Commission chairman. And because of the resign before you run bill, which was Harry Geisinger's bill actually, Mm -hmm. to keep Lester Maddox from running for other things. uh, Because of that, he had to resign and there was a special election, which I won. Okay. How was the how was the legislature different? How how had it changed since you left in in seventy eight to uh, ninety four ninety five? Three things were were prominent. Number one, there were a lot more Republicans. Uh, so in ninety three, there were probably you know, the ninety the big ele- we had big elections in ninety two, ninety four, ninety six. We had big big gains. Right. Um, and so we had a big intake in 92. So there were probably 50 Republican, 52, I think, when I got there in 93. Um, so that's number one. Number two is um, the average quality, I have to say this, the average quality of the membership had declined. Uh, you know, the people that, that, the kind of people you had in the 70s uh, just weren't there in the, in the, 80, in the 90s. So, you know, Elliot Levitas was a state rep in the 70s. Jerry Horton, Sidney Marcus, you know, Mike Egan, uh, George Larson, Wash Larson, Arthur Gentilat, people all around the state. The average quality of the legislature had, had declined uh, in, since the 70s. And the third thing was not a change. It was sort of like a time warp because when I left, uh, Tom Murphy was the speaker and Bill Lee was the <laughs> chairman of the Rules Committee. Come back, Tom Murphy, still speaker. Bill Lee's still, still chair of the Rules Committee, <laughs> and so it was sort of a. It was interesting. It was like it was as if you know, it had all been in amber for twenty years. Yeah, you know, <laughs> nothing had changed. You were elected uh, minority leader. Mm-hmm. Um, ninety four. Not in ninety four, and, and you had replaced uh, or succeeded Paul, Steve Stansel. Steve Stansel. Mm-hmm. You, you were elected in a special election in ninety three. Yeah. Very unusual to go straight into to leadership. Well, it is. Um, you have to remember, I had uh, six years previous. Uh, so, you know, I... It, it, sort I of a special case. Yeah, I mean, I, I was... Um, I didn't have, an, how to say this, an average first-year knowledge of the legislature. Sure. I knew more about how it worked. Uh, and so um, I think that was part of it. And, and the other key to it is always who you run against, right? And so, you know... I ran against, in the end, uh, one guy that went to prison and uh, one guy that became a Democrat, <laughs> and, a, and a fourth candidate who was a good guy. <laughs> but to you know, to be fair, it took what six or seven ballots. Yeah. So it eight, was, I think, eight, eight ballots. Yeah. But I was I was really uh, asked to run by. By Garland Penholster okay. uh, and Steve Stansel. Okay. Steve didn't want to run again because Steve was planning on running for Congress in '94, '94, no '96. He was planning on running. He was planning on running against Nathan Deal, who at that time was still a Democrat. Right. Right. And so Steve didn't want to run for minority leader again, and he and Garland asked me to run for minority leader. So, how did you, um, how did you sell yourself to the caucus? Um, it was interesting. The thing that finally broke the, uh, it was a, the reason there were so many ballots was it was a tie. Okay. 
Um, and the thing that finally broke the tie, and then I won by 10 votes, was um, Burke Day from Chatham County asked each of us a question. The, the guy, the other finalist was Scott Dix. He's the one that became a Democrat. Um, Burke Day asked us a question and said, can you tell us an instance of how you've been able to reach across the aisle and work with the Democrats? And I had lots of good examples, and Scott Dix didn't have any examples. <laughs> and so... Um, I Ironic think, for a future Democrat. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what, uh, what decided it. So you, as, uh, you know, now that you are in leadership um, and get to sort of really craft sort of the message or the I issue and the messaging of the party, what did you try to pursue and what were, what was the purpose behind the policies and the policy positions that you and the party were taking? So we were uh, trying to create, uh, a, if you will, a vision and a set of policies for the state. And I can't, I, I'm not sure that I can rattle off the vision now, but it was <laughs> that we want to create a state uh, that is uh, safe, prosperous, well-educated uh, and honest. I mean, that may have been it. I know safe and, and prosperous and well-educated were right. And we set out then to, uh, to create um, signature policies that would, uh, would promote those uh, goals. Mm -hmm. So we could say, here's what we want to create if you vote us into power, we want this kind of state. Uh, and here's the things that we're pursuing in, in this legislative session to promote that. Um, one of them was safe. Uh, and so uh, we had a proposal that actually originally came from Mike Bowers, which was to uh, require in Georgia that uh, all violent offenders had to serve at least 85% of their sentence. There, was, there were a lot of people let out early. Uh, a lot of them commit more crimes. This was the federal standard. Uh, 85% sentence, and so, so we pursued that, and uh, we worked on it for uh, a couple of years, and we actually ended up being able to, to get a vote on it, uh, and uh, the Republicans unanimously voted for it, and most Democrats voted against it because Tom Murphy twisted their arms to vote against it, and that, that helped us uh, pick up 10 seats in the 96 election. Uh, there were seats that, that I know were decided on exactly that issue. And, and we did that on, on other issues as well, but that was, that was probably the one that was the most successful politically. Um, in, in 94, um, Guy Milner uh, makes his first run for statewide office mm -hmm. against Zell, uh, Governor Miller, excuse me. Um, tell me the, 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 the impact of having Guy Milner, sort of a self-funded, I'm not going to say political amateur because he was involved in, in, in the party, but a first-time candidate, sort of an outsider candidate. What, what was the impact of those elections in 94, 96, 98? Guy was, um, particularly in 94, I think Guy was a, uh, was a helpful influence uh, yeah. on the party because it was, it was clear that he was uh, uh, going to have a chance to beat uh, Zell Miller. And, you know, there's nothing that brings a political party together like the prospect of victory. <laughs> sure, right? sure. So, uh, so Guy, Guy was, uh, turned out to be a pretty good candidate that year. I think, you know, we were always worried about money, so the fact that, and we were always behind the eight ball because we were the minority party and nobody who was trying to preserve their influence would give money to the minority party. So it was, it was uh, uh, in a way, I think for a lot of Republicans, it was kind of, uh, relieving to have uh, somebody who did have the, who, who you knew would have the financial resources to run it himself. Guy actually did not fund his, his campaign entirely himself the first time. He actually raised money. Uh, I think his second and third campaigns he decided raising money was just too hard and took too much time away and he just fund himself. But he actually did raise money the first time. 1990s are also, um, even though there, there were gains in, in Congress, um, and in the House, there wasn't sort of the what you would call a breakthrough in the 1990s for mm -hmm. Republicans, but there was steady growth. What what were the factors that that led to this sort of the 
that steady growth leading towards a Republican breakthrough? I think most of it was really uh, the way that we were crafting the message and creating votes in the legislature, to be honest about it. Um, the party was also growing, so uh, uh, the party was uh, raising more money and giving more money to legislative candidates. Uh, when Rusty was the state chairman, there were uh, clear priorities to fund legislative races. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we created, uh, 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 by, by trying to create these issues in this platform, we created something for uh, candidates to talk about in, in running for the legislature. It's, um, and, you know, no criticism intended of most first-time legislative candidates. A lot of them don't really know what to talk about. They, uh, they have uh, opinions and they have feelings about things, but they, have a hard, they, they don't know enough in a lot of cases to be able to articulate good issues to right. run against an incumbent. So we helped them do that. Uh, and that and the votes that, that we've been able to set up uh, helped us win some seats. Uh, there was also a uh, really a, a breakthrough in '97 uh, when we had the, the usual pattern with uh, Governor Miller was that we'd propose something and then he'd propose the same thing or something that was <laughs> a slightly watered down version of what we were proposing because he could that was he could feel the politics of that. So uh, uh, he did that on the the. Uh, the 85% sentence bill, for example. So even though we were not able to pass that bill, uh, we elected some members based on it. And then, uh, then what he did was he directed the State Board of Pardons and Paroles to put that policy in place so that they wouldn't release anybody uh, until they'd served 85% of their sentence. Well, that's, you know, that's a victory. We weren't able to pass the statute, but we were able to get the effect of it by, by having the State Par Board of Pardons and Paroles do it. Right. So we'd had some victories. Uh, but then in 97, uh, um, again, I think in, in part reacting to, to our success promoting welfare reform, in part reacting to the fact that it got pas passed nationally, right. uh, he proposed welfare reform in the, uh, in the state. And Tom Murphy was against it. Uh, I remember him telling me, he said, you know, if we, if we uh, pass welfare reform, we'll have riots in the streets. And um, so the main force behind it in the House was the Republicans. Uh, and Len and I spent uh, months doing actual, a lot of research on, on the welfare system in the state. And, wrote, and we wrote a good bill, uh, which Tom Murphy got substituted by his own sort of concoction at the last minute. And the normal pattern would, would have been, what he expected to happen, I'm sure, was that the House would pass his version, uh, the Senate would insist on its version, which was the governor's version, it would be a conference committee, and right. then, you know, nothing would happen. So, but we actually passed welfare reform in the House on the last night of the, the session in 1997. And uh, Tom Murphy did something I'd never seen him do. He not only... I mean, Often on bills that he really personally opposed, he would go down to the well and speak on. Uh, so that was a signal, you know, to the Democrats, you better pay attention because right. Speaker of the House has gone and actually made comments. This one, he not only did that, he actually stayed on the floor and managed the bill. I mean, he, you know, he proposed amendments and I objected and I proposed amendments and he objected and he made all the parliamentary motions on their side. So I'd never seen him done that before. And we, and we won. We, uh, we beat him and then sent it back over to the Senate, and the Senate just passed exactly what we passed because they didn't want to send it back over <laughs> to the House again either. And, but that, what that created was that actually created five Democratic switchers mm -hmm. uh, because the issue was just too strong in their, in their own area uh, for them to stand up. And um, so you know, we, were, we were hopeful that that would create the big breakthrough, but it right. was a big deal. I forgot to ask. Um, were you still as involved in the state party um, in the 90s yeah. as leader as you had been in the 1970s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How had the state party organization, uh, had they become more cooperative um, yeah, you, in framing I mean, those messages? You made the point, and I never thought about it this way, but that's, it's true, I think. Under, under, with, with Rusty Paul and also with uh, Chuck Clay, and I think even to some extent with Billy Lovett before Rusty, 
they, they started running the state party like a political consulting firm, you know, helping raise money for candidates, giving candidates campaign advice. And, of course, that was exactly what those of us in the legislature wanted the state party mm-hmm. to do, right? to, to, uh, to, to raise money and to do mailings and to help craft campaigns and, and help people get elected. Um, you left leadership um, after the 2000 election. W- were you challenged? Yeah. Okay. T- tell me about that. Um, about the about I believe it's Lynn West. You mentioned yeah. Lynn Lynn Westmoreland. Lynn West, that wasn't the Lynn I was talking oh, about. I was, I was talking about my wife Lynn who did oh. this. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I mean, just an aside. I'll answer your question in a minute. But an aside sure. on this, um, Governor Miller uh, gave us access to the uh, defects people in Bibb County, and so uh, Lynn went down and interviewed every unwed teenage mother in Bibb County that was on welfare. Uh, and it's the, it, even today, it's, it's the largest database, I'm sure, of interviews of welfare recipients that's ever been done. Hmm. Uh, because, you know, you read an article in the New York Times and it's based on talking to two people. Right. You know, this was uh, over 100. Uh, and, you know, learned their stories and learned about what we were looking for was what the incentives are. Right. You know, so how does the welfare system create incentives for, for behavior that's not productive? Okay. And what could you change to, to make it create behavior that is productive? So that's, that was the basis, on, the basis we used. Okay. We used that. Uh, and we used uh, the welfare reform uh, uh, program that uh, Governor Tommy Thompson had gotten passed in Wisconsin okay. as, as the basis for the bill that we wrote. Okay. So you're challenged not by Lynn, your wife, <laughs> but Lynn Westmoreland, Sharps, Sharpsburg uh, right. Republican. Why, why was there a challenge in 2000, since the party had been growing? and Yeah. Well, we uh, we lost two seats in '98, uh, and we lost two seats in 2000, and so that was sort of the the basis. Of course, when when Lynn Westmoreland, I have to say this, when Lynn Westmoreland was the minority leader, we lost more seats than that. Uh, but that was sort of the the basis for the for the '98 challenge. Roy, Roy Barnes said, said that I lost because uh, I wasn't as conservative as Lynn Westmoreland, and there may be some truth in that too. I mean that that's sort of the conventional wisdom I, su- I suppose in the newspapers that here here's you know representative Irvin who is the establishment wing versus the you know more conservative I guess uh, the ascending conservative wing yeah it, it's hard to um, it, it's hard I have to say to to think of Lynn Westmoreland as a conservative because um, he, he would go to the well and say, now this is a tight budget, meaning it's a very conservative budget with mm-hmm. no room to spare. It's not true. I mean, you know, he would, uh, the, Mike Bowers told me this, I think it's true. He said you could cut the state government by a third and the public would never notice the difference. Marvin Arrington, by the way, told me the same thing about the city of Atlanta government. <laughs> individual people, individual interest groups would notice, but right. the public wouldn't notice. And, and yet, you know, you'd think a conservative would be somebody who was trying to cut the budget and, you know, hold down spending. That wasn't Westmoreland, but in any event. But 2000 is not the end of, of your elective uh, career. You run in 2002. I uh, ran for U.S. Senate. For U.S. Senate. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that primary. It was a very tough primary because uh, the, they, had, they had decided in Washington that the candidate ought to be a congressman, and the congressman who they being the Bush White House Bush or White RNC, House. Yeah, RNC. Yeah. Bush, Bush White House RNC. Okay, they had decided that uh, the candidate ought to be a congressman, and the congressman who ended up without a district was Saxby, and so he ended up as the the candidate. Uh, but I had a uh, a press conference um, during two thousand and one, uh, and it was on the subject of transportation. And I had a press conference at the state capital on transportation. And Dick Pettis, who you may remember was an AP reporter, right. at the end of the press conference, Dick came up to me and said, 
Uh, there's a story that's just moved on the wire that Governor Bush, when he was in the Air National Guard, took cocaine. Do you have any anything to say to Governor Bush? And I said, tell the truth. You know, whatever the truth is, tell the truth. Sure. So that seemed to me like that was kind of an obvious, you know, bit of advice to give. But I got a call late that night from uh, the Bush National Headquarters from in uh, Austin, from Kenny Melman, mm -hmm. and said, uh, "This is this is not helpful. You need to you need to say that uh, Governor Bush didn't take cocaine." And I said, "Well, did he?" And he said, <laughs> "Well, that's not important." Uh, and so we just, we talked on this theme for a little while, mm -hmm. and I finally said, "Look." You're not willing to say in private to me right. that Governor Bush right. didn't take cocaine, and yet you want me to go out and say that in public <laughs> when when I have no knowledge of it. I said, I'm not going to do that. I said, that you know, I won't be credible. That'll endanger my credibility. And so, so I got another call later that night uh, saying, you know, you really better change your opinion on this. That was from Eric Tannenblatt. Uh, and... And I said, no, I, you know, they won't even tell me in private. Why, sh you know, why should I go tell them in public? But anyway, this sort of morphed over time into Bob Irvin's not a team player, which I heard a lot from the Bush White House. And they came down. Uh, Bush came in twice for Chambliss, and uh, uh, Cheney came in once for Chambliss, I think, all in the primary. Uh, so you know, it was a very turned out to be a very tough election. Do you think that was? It was more of a, I don't want to call it a personal beef or anything like that, but sort of a, a, a lingering divide between you and, and, and the Bush White House. No, I think it was a personal beef. So, so this was, we shouldn't take the 2002 election as sort of a, a referendum on, on the ideological makeup of the party or no. something like that? No. Okay, so a very tough election. Um, but at the same time, for the party, you know, Saxby Champlis mm. does win. Uh, Sonny Perdue, um, who had switched parties a few years back, um, also wins. Um, was that a surprise to you? Were you surprised that both either or or both and were I was, elected? Then? I was not real surprised. I mean, Sonny's, Sonny's election was an upset, right? of course. And... Uh, Round numbers, he spent $3 million and Roy Barnes spent $20 million. Um, but um, you, you could tell, I could tell in, in going around the state in my campaign for the Senate that, um, uh, that Roy had made a lot of people mad. Mm -hmm. uh, he had made the teachers mad uh, because uh, I didn't even have private school teachers come up to me and they were mad about what he was saying about teachers. He was talking about public school teachers, right? But, but they all took it personally, you know, about sure. what he was, that he was criticizing teachers. So he made them mad. He made um, uh, a lot of conservatives uh, mad about uh, getting rid of the Confederate flag off the state flag. Uh, and he made a lot of people, this was kind of the sleeper issue, I think. He made a lot of people in rural areas mad by reapportionment. I think you picked up on all of these in your papers, but the reapportionment thing was a big deal uh, because uh, in the you know in Fulton County, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, you're used to funny-looking districts and everything getting chopped up, you know, six ways to Sunday. But that didn't used to happen in rural areas. And I remember uh, the county clerk of uh, of uh, Carroll County said to me, you know, we're in six different Senate districts, and that was new to them, and they didn't like it. Uh, they and to some extent they were were right that it diluted their influence, because you know if your whole county is is right. in a senate district, you're going to have more influence than if one sixth of it is. So that made a lot of people mad, and that was obviously done uh, at the governor's behest. And so I think all those things uh, uh, turned around and and bit him. In, in 2000, also in 2002, um, Sonny Perdue had, a, there was a three-way primary mm -hmm. uh, with, with, with Sonny Perdue, Bill Byrne, and Linda Shrinka. Linda Shrinka. Yeah. What, what did it say about sort of the direction or the growth of the Republican Party that 
the governor's the go- nominee for governor was a guy from Bonaire in in middle Georgia. The nominee for Senate was was a, a guy from Moultrie down in down in South Georgia. What did that, did that is, there, said, is there a larger takeaway? What it said was they were both Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> Sa- Saxby Chandler had worked for Pierre Howard uh, for lieutenant governor as late as 1990, and then he then he became a Republican and got elected to Congress in '94. Um, I, I knew Sonny better. I mean, Sonny Sonny was the wasn't just a Democrat. He was the president pro tem mm-hmm. of the Senate. Uh, and he had sort of had the Senate Democratic Caucus taken away from him by Charles Walker, who was a uh, uh, Democrat from Augusta. And so uh, Sonny switched parties, and you know, I, you know, every move like that, there's lots of motives. But one of the motives, clearly, I think, was to get away from Charles Walker, that you know, because he had really taken the Senate away from him, the Democratic Caucus away from him. And so uh, Sonny became a Republican. That was sort of a refuge, mm-hmm. um, but he was very he was very helpful as a member of the Senate caucus, uh, and most of the establishment of the party was for Sonny, partly on the theory, and he he used this in the campaign. He said, "I'm the only uh, candidate from South Georgia since Bo Calloway," mm-hmm. um, and that you know that was a good line because people were used to candidates running from Atlanta and losing, and so it was a good line. I did point out to Bill Byrne that he there's a counter line, which is, no, actually there was one other one. That was Ronnie Thompson. <laughs> I don't think Bill ever used the line. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people had just forced themselves to forget about 1974. Yeah. But, but when Sonny would use that line, people's head would nod because sure. you know, there was this theory that if you'd nominate somebody from, from South Georgia, who was a good candidate, or nominate somebody who's from South Georgia, that they'd have you know, an extra chance to win. Why were, why were Georgia Democrats able to hold on as long as 2002? To, and obviously the, they held the, the House until 2005, uh, the legislative session. Why were Georgia Democrats able to hold on so long in a deep South state like this? They, they were able to win because they would win. Uh, and there are, <clears throat> uh, there are really two groups in the state that were critical to the Democrats continuing to be able to be the majority party. One was rural whites, uh, and the other is the business community. And those are two groups that uh, uh, always have something that they want from the state government. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, Everybody knows the business community always wants something from state government. I think it's a little less appreciated how much uh, Rural areas of the state depend on the state government. Right. Uh, so a lot of a lot of counties in South Georgia, uh, you know, really needed the in, in their view needed state money to be able to stay to stay afloat. They needed state support for their school system. They needed state uh, uh, minimum salaries for their elected officials. State paid those things. Pays, pays salary of the sheriff, the county commissioners, the the tax commissioner. Um, maybe not the county commissioners, but the taxpayer, tax commissioner and the sheriff, state pays some of that. Uh, so these communities really depend on the state, uh, state money coming into the community. And the Democratic Party was, was their channel to get this done. Uh, a lot of the voters, even a lot of the elected officials uh, in South Georgia who were Democrats themselves, even as early as the 70s, weren't really Democrats. I mean, they would vote Republican for president. Right. Uh, then increasingly they'd vote Republican for Congress. And it would have been perfectly hap- perfectly fine with them as early as the 80s to have a Republican state government. But what they didn't want to have happen is they didn't want to support a Republican and lose and have the state government still be the, the, the Democrats because then you lose your, your influence to deal with the state. And... For your own community's sake, not just your own personal sake, for your community's sake, you needed to be able to have uh, a a fully functioning cooperative relationship with the state government. And so once there was a Republican governor, all that fell away. Uh, And uh, then you saw massive switches of of people in the legislature and also of voters. We we started winning the vote for the state house uh, as early as 1996. Right. 
and uh, they were only kept in, in place by gerrymandering. I, th I think it was, it was Chuck Bullock, Professor Bullock, who, who wrote that in the legislature, an important element of splitting the, what was called the, the, the night and day coalition, rural whites and African Americans, were those hard votes on realignment, uh, excuse me, reapportionment, mm -hmm. um, and especially crime and welfare bills. What's your take on that? Uh, reapportionment was not an issue until uh, till the Roy Barnes session. Mm -hmm. I, I agree on, on welfare, on crime, on uh, education, uh, and uh, a few other issues. I think those were those were important because what they what they did was, and we would get rural Democratic votes for our position on on those bills, mm -hmm. especially on welfare. I mean, we were we had seventy, I guess seventy two Republicans then, so. We couldn't pass it by ourselves. I mean, we, it took right. rural Democrats to vote for it. And uh, what it what it did was it made them um, uncomfortable in two ways. It made them uncomfortable with their electorate because uh, siding with uh, with Tom Murphy and the Democratic coalition, which was increasingly, you know, driven by the liberal side of the the caucus caused them problems with their electorate, but it also caused problems with them personally. I mean, they just didn't like this. You know, they were individually, a lot of them were conservative people, and as I said, had been voting Republican for big races for years. Mm -hmm. And they were only held in place by the expectation that the government would still go on being controlled by the Democrats, and you didn't want to be on the outs. And once, once you were on on the ends by being with the Republicans, it was easy and it was a landslide. Some people have said that, that you know, the governing priorities are the way the Republican Party has governed the state of Georgia since 2003, 2004, 2005 is not really that different from how conservative Democratic governors and, and, and legislatures govern the state. Would you agree? I think there's some truth in that. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that the Republicans don't get enough credit for is holding down the size of the state budget. The, the state budget is growing again now because there's more prosperity. Sure. But the, the, the state budget, I'm going to be a little hazy on, on the dates, but the state budget in more or less, let's say, 2014 was the same size as Roy Barnes' last budget. And that would have been 2002. Like 20, 2002. So it was 20 billion, 21 billion, something like that. They held it down uh, uh, for all those years. Uh, and, you know, if you'd had Democratic governors, it would have grown, you know, 25% or more in those years, even mm -hmm. though a lot of them were kind of lean years. I don't mean 25% a year, but 25% total, it would have been 25% higher. And so I think the Republicans deserve credit for doing that. And, there, you know, there is a... I think the state still is uh, oriented toward uh, uh, business uh, success and prosperity, and if you want to say that's what uh, George Busby Democrats were doing, I think that's right. I, you know, is are are we are, are the Republicans doing the same things now that Roy Barnes did? No, uh, and. Zell Miller kind of morphed into halfway or Republican, but you know, I th so I think there are differences, some differences in tone and emphasis, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are significant economic differences. But overall, the characterization is, you know, the Democratic governors in the old days were kind of halfway Republicans, and that's sort of the same general tone. I think that's probably right. What would you say the top policy priorities of the Republican majority? Here in Georgia, is is it is it just a pro growth ethos, or is I, it something more than I that? I think I think it's everything that creates prosperity, um, and you know this this is one of my mantras at the moment is that nothing brings society together like prosperity, right? I mean, if if people can can make something out of their their lives, create you know, good lives for their families and their children, mm -hmm. you know, give their children, you know, opportunities. If you can do all that, then a lot of the divisions fall away. If everybody is participating in this, there's nothing that brings society together like that. So I think the way I would interpret it, I don't 
you know, I don't know if others say this, but the way I would interpret it is that everything that the Republican uh, caucus in general tries to pursue, doesn't mean people don't have individual issues, um, is related to creating prosperity. So that's, that's uh, uh, low taxes, it's uh, uh, you know, restraint on regulation, it's good education, it's uh, transportation, uh, all those things, I think, sort of come together in the, in the, the, for the goal of creating prosperity. Criminal justice, I mean, public safety goes mm -hmm. together to create prosperity. I think that's the, that's the guiding theme for all of it. Uh, and, you know, if your question is, were there pro-growth Democrats in the past? Yeah, there were. There's also divisions within the Republican Party about things like education, for example. There was a very big divide over... Uh, I don't remember if it was the failing school amendment or, or, or what, what the specific term of the amendment yeah. was, but also over um, the t Splost vote back in 2012 yep. um, that sort of split the Republican Party on, on that issue. Well, no party's monolithic, right? right? I mean, I don't think the, the discussion about the, uh, um, the failing school amendment was as much within the Republican Party as it was uh, with people on the you know, kind of no party people. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the the politics of that was, I mean, the, to me, the policy of it is unarguable, right? I mean, if there are if there are schools that are failing, uh, how are you going to fix them? Are you going to fix them with the same people who were in charge when they failed? Well, you know, it's hard to say that that's the answer. Uh, a lot of people felt that it was a local control issue. So a lot of people who were PTAs. Right. Uh, school teachers, right. uh, school professionals opposed that. Uh, the Democrats opposed it, I think, because it was opportunistic, right? I mean, it was because it was a Republican proposal. They were against it. But I think the case for it is is pretty unarguable. The T-Splost, uh, I think, was a different kind of an issue. Uh, and, I mean, I voted against the T-Splost myself, uh, even though I strongly believe that we need to spend more money on, on uh, transportation. But... The list of projects mm -hmm. that the T. Splost uh, put forward was a completely political list. It was it was drawn up by uh, elected officials and, and politicians. There was no analysis behind it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I suggested uh, in a, a newspaper article as a way to solve this problem was that the the uh, the state DOT and or the ARC could construct a measure of how much each of these projects was going to reduce congestion. And that what they ought to do is they ought to take the top 100 projects that would reduce congestion and then let the, poli the political group choose among those, mm -hmm. right? but that everything on the list would have to be something that was going to be one of the most important projects to reduce congestion. That wasn't the, the way the list was constructed. It was right. constructed completely politically. So why should we raise taxes to, to build more politically... Uh, design roads. I didn't think that made any sense. If they had been able to uh, to demonstrate that this was going to have an effect, mm -hmm. uh, and do that by analysis, which you could do the analysis, it wasn't you know it wasn't something that was a pipe dream to do it. Then I would have voted for it, but I voted against it myself. Since we're on the issue of transportation, this is something I asked Rusty Paul the other day: was what is the future uh, of, of transportation? What what are Atlanta's critical transportation needs. And we're talking mid-September 2017, Google is looking for an, a, a second headquarters. One of the major points that they're looking for in, in, in the new community is a, a modern transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And obviously we can debate it. Atlanta at this point does not have the best transportation system for its needs. Mm -hmm. How how do how does Atlanta and the metropolitan area, Georgia, the Southeast, get to where it needs to be, transportation wise? So if you're if you're asking substantively, uh, as opposed to process, mm -hmm. the 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 answer we can I talk think, about process. Yeah, <laughs> like, the, the the answer I think is uh, you know everything you can think of, you do some of. There's no magic silver right. bullet, uh, and uh, I mean to me, I think. More highways is part of the answer. Uh, dedicated busways is part of the answer. 
Uh, heavy rail MARTA is part of the answer. Uh, but the thing you have to, to do the analysis on is, uh, first of all, you have to agree on the objective. And, you know, there's always objectives about, uh, you know, dis disputes about what the objective ought to be. To me, the most important objective, not the only thing, but by far the most important is reduce congestion, right? So do projects that reduce congestion. And um, so then you could say, well, you know, which of these projects do the best job of that for the dollar? Mm -hmm. I mean, I like rail transit too, but it is frightfully expensive. Uh, Especially on the front end. You know, yeah. buses, uh, buses running on dedicated busways is always one of my favorite solutions because it achieves some of the benefits of uh, fixed rail transit mm -hmm. a lot cheaper. Uh, but, you know, sure enough, highways are, are part of the problem, are part of the solution. They're always going to be part of the solution. I mean, there are cities in the country who have double-decked uh, some of their critical uh, in interstates, and I think we probably ought to do that too. And, and the other thing is, you know, it's true that Atlanta has a lot of congestion. Um, and, but to some extent, that's the, the price of success. I mean, there is, there is not a successful city in the world that isn't, doesn't have traffic congestion. I mean, you know, you think about uh, London, you think about New York, you think mm -hmm. about Chicago, uh, you think about Paris. I mean, these, are, these places are all have congestion. Right. So, you know, you've got to keep constructing your, your uh, transportation infrastructure to stay ahead of it. And, you know, this goes back to the T-SPLOST referendum. I, I do believe we need to spend more on our transportation system, mm -hmm. but it needs to be analytically driven so that you're actually getting the most for your dollar rather than politically driven. What role does sort of the regulation of development along roads play? There, there's a role for that because uh, development creates congestion. Right. Right. So, um, so uh, you know, MARTA has, has uh, uh, had programs in place for a long time for what they call transit-oriented development. The city and state support that. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be, uh, you, you know, zoning is, is very much of a, of a local issue. It's locally driven. Uh, needs to be locally driven. I don't think you could ever do that from, from the state level. So it all interacts. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and local communities, I think, especially where the zoning decisions are made, uh, need to keep in mind the, the traffic impact of uh, zoning decisions that they make. They don't always do that. We talked a little bit earlier about a, a rural and urban divide um, in politics and in the state. Is there still a lingering anti-Atlanta, anti-Metro resentment that is going to hamper sort of the, the modernization and development of that transportation infrastructure we've been talking about? I don't think, it, I don't think it's a serious uh, uh, inhibitor to that. I mean, y yes, you're always going to have uh, people uh, out in the state who resent Metro Atlanta, who think Metro Atlanta gets more money than it deserves. And people in Metro Atlanta think the same about, about rural areas. I mean, one of the, one of the things uh, that rural legislators have, have pushed for a long time is what used to be called developmental highways. I, I don't remember what the term is now. But, yeah. but, but there, you know, the thing about political issues like that is there's always something to it, right? I right. mean, the, uh, one, of the, one of the big success stories for years in economic development in South Georgia was Coffee County. Yeah. And uh, what, I mean, they had good leadership that drove this, but substantively what, what the good leadership drove was a lot of logistics infrastructure, warehouses. To succeed at that, you've got to have good roads to connect you with interstates. Right. So, you know, there's something to the good roads point. Good roads all by themselves don't do the job. But heck, I mean, I even read a newspaper in Spain one time that, you know, they were promoting what they would call developmental highways. Right. You know, the communities were saying, we need good, good highways to, to have a good economy. So, so there's something to that. I think the, 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 the more important needs, uh, where there's a divide, not so much a divide, but just a real problem in uh, rural areas today is in, uh, especially in healthcare. Right. A lot of rural hospitals. A lot of rural hospitals are closing. They can't, uh, you know, the economics don't support it. Mm -hmm. uh, does every county need a hospital? Probably not, but the, 
but the whole system is not set up in a way that that makes that easy to do without. And mm-hmm. So, so it's uh, it's a problem. Back to politics. What what is the what is the greatest danger imperiling a Republican majority in Georgia, either short term or long term? Um, selfishness. Uh, the 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 greatest uh, the greatest danger is becoming the party of the ends, mm-hmm. um, because um, what happens over time as you become the party of the ends is you quit thinking about the needs of the public and you start thinking about your own needs, and you see this uh, all the time with with individual members. But this sort of, in a way, became the, the ethos of the Democratic Party in the legislature. They became, you know, focused on the legislature instead mm-hmm. of being focused on the state. And so you do bad things, and you also, you know, create bad PR. And so I think um, uh, the greatest danger for the Republican majority is to kind of begin thinking of themselves before they think about the state. And that's just... You know, I'm not being critical of any individual person, sure. but that's just kind of the nature of, of being the majority party. It, uh, you know, you got to guard against that. What about population growth or, or population change, demographic change? That's mm-hmm. the word I'm looking for. There, there, there's a theory that, that demographics are destiny, that the changing, evolving demographics of Georgia is going to uh, make Georgia, if not a blue state, a purple state. Um, where do you stand on the, on the debate regarding well, demographics? Well, I mean, you've been reading for years that mm-hmm. the Democrats are peddling this notion that the state is going to get more Hispanic voters and more black voters and, you know, they're going to outvote the Republicans. Well, that assumes that the Republicans aren't going to do anything about appealing to any of these voters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's that just isn't true. Uh, and it's also a real insult to <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> but... Um, the, uh, you know, I mean, Donald Trump got 27% of the Hispanic vote nationwide. Uh, and, you know, there are other Republicans who can get more than that. And, um, you know, we're even beginning, it, it, it's hard given the history in this state and given the, the current makeup of state party politics, not Republican party politics, partisan politics. Sure. It's, it's hard for Republicans to get black votes. But you see uh, a lot of black people now uh, at Republican events and running as Republican candidates. Uh, so that'll eventually, you know, uh, that'll eventually, I think, result in uh, you know Republican candidates as a whole getting more mm-hmm. more black votes. So uh, I, you know, I, I'm I'm really not worried about the the democratic demographic mm-hmm. changes. I think it assumes Republicans don't do anything about it, and I think Republicans will do something about it. We uh, and are doing something about it. We're, we're a few months removed now from a hotly contested special election uh, in the six congressional districts, now not far from here. Um, between first John Ossoff and the field, mm-hmm. and then the runoff mm-hmm. of John Ossoff and, and, and now Congresswoman Karen Handel. John Ossoff was able to get 48, just over 48% of the vote in the 6th Congressional District. Pretty fair showing for mm-hmm. any Democrat mm-hmm. um, by any standard. It, was that simply a, a short-term uh, phenomenon based on the 2016 election, or is that indicative of something else, something deeper? No, I don't think it's an indicative of anything deeper. I think, uh, I mean, he spent more than anybody had ever spent for a congressional race. Mm-hmm. The Democrats spent more than, than the Republicans put together, not a lot more, but, and the congressional race, you know, by itself was $50 million, more or less. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, you know, it was a, a huge boon for uh, for TV. Oh, sure, yeah. Channel yeah. Channel 11, everybody wants their political ads on the, in the news hour. So Channel 11, I think it was, one of the channels, actually added another news hour. to, to <laughs> a con- And they, they announced this. They said this was the reason they were doing it, because, you know, people want to buy more political ads. So they added another news hour. The, um, uh, the, the Republican feel was so totally split. I mean, I, I really think yeah. the party should have uh, stepped in to reduce the number of Republican candidates. Now you say that's 
heavy-handed, let them all run, you know, maybe. But there were clearly people in the race who, who were not going to come close. And the party should have narrowed the field and saved money and, and gotten, you know, helped uh, get Republicans focused on, you know, two or three candidates instead of 15 or however many there were. Yeah, um, but the Democrats kind of had the opposite problem. Uh, because somebody said uh, the day after the election that John Ossoff's number one problem was his address. And I think there's truth in that. I mean, he he didn't live in the district. Um, he lived here in the 5th. He, yeah, he, lived, he lives at Emory. And um, the, uh, you know, in, in a way, that's a symbolic issue, but in a way it's not a symbolic issue, too, because what it was a symbol of is... Uh, and, and I think accurately this, he didn't know the district, right? I mean, he'd spent no time with the people who were citizens of the district. Uh, he'd lived his whole life, uh, his whole adult life in Washington and then at Emory. And so, you know, it was some, it was, you know, just a talking point that he couldn't vote for himself. That's not a big deal. But it was a big deal that he didn't know anything about sure. the district. And so the Democrats' problem was kind of the opposite of the Republican problem, that they too quickly zeroed in on somebody who didn't have any local base at all. There were, there were local Democrats who uh, had a base who uh, would have, if they'd been funded the way Ossoff was funded, sure. they would have run better races, I think. But they wouldn't have been funded the way he was funded because his nomination was driven from Washington, and that's who raised all the money for it. 2016, um, historic election, presidential election. Mm -hmm. Um, that what is the the short term, long term effect of Donald Trump on the Republican Party? It's too early to tell. Too early to tell. I mean, I you know I I voted for Trump. He was not my first choice, but uh, but uh, I voted for him, and I think we still ought to ought to give him the chance to uh, to do what he uh, can do for the country. Uh, and I think many of the things that Trump uh, does are things that command wide support in the Republican Party and in the country. There are things that he says that, that you know, some, sometimes undercut some of the things he does. But um, if, he can, if he can help create prosperity in the country, uh, I think he'll be reelected. Uh, mm -hmm. the, I mean, no politician creates prosperity, right? It's the business community and the people that create sure. Prosperity, but politicians can help create the the ground rules and the and the the, uh, um, the in, enabling conditions for prosperity. And just like I said before, there's nothing that brings the country together like prosperity. Um, you know, one of the things you you ask yourself is why do so many people who are millennials why were they for Bernie Sanders? And I think part of the answer is they've never actually seen a capitalist system that worked. They saw, they've seen eight years of George Bush and eight years of uh, Barack Obama. In, in, you know, that whole period of time, the economy wasn't in very good shape. And so they've never actually seen an economy like we had in the 80s and the 90s. If you see that, you realize how much better it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've never had the chance to benefit from it. So uh, I think the most important thing that the president and the Congress can do is create the conditions for prosperity. Um, in, in the fall of 1983, Reagan was at 35% of the polls. And he got reelected by a landslide in 84, not because Mondale was a terrible candidate. He wasn't. I mean, Mondale was not a McGovern. Mondale was a, you know, if you believe what he believed, Mondale was a good candidate. Um, but he, Reagan got reelected because the economic policies finally took hold and created a prosperity in the country. And, and, and by the same token, Bill Clinton, 1994. Clinton also, that's right. Uh, even though nominated. Clinton doesn't even deserve credit for it. Clinton was part of the credit. <laughs> the credit was Clinton and Newt together, I think. Right. But, um, but Clinton does deserve part of the credit. And that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. He got reelected in 96 when you wouldn't have thought he possibly could. Now... You know, since we're talking about prosperity in the capitalist system, a lot of the the appeal uh, that Donald Trump had, especially in places like West Virginia, Kentucky, um, Eastern Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, is sort of what, for the lack of a better term, economic nationalism or mm -hmm. populism. 
anti- Well, more to the an, point, coal. And coal, <laughs> yeah, coal, coal, coal. Um, but anti-free trade, mm-hmm. um, you know, taxes a bit more. Um, I think he, President Trump came out the other day and said that if taxes need to go up on high-income earners, they should go up. Not, not exactly sort of post-1981 Republican orthodoxy. Yeah, well, there's an, there's an example of something that Trump says that I think undercuts something he's going to do. Because in the campaign, he said, you know, tax cuts for everybody. I think right. that's, that's more appealing than, than that particular comment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he gets there. You know, he doesn't always get there in a direct line, but he usually mm-hmm. gets there. During the election, um, if you flipped on the TV set and the only, the only election returns you saw were that Hillary Clinton had, won, had carried Cobb County and carried Gwinnett County, uh, most would have thought she was on her way to a 300-some uh, electoral vote victory. But Donald Trump underperformed in, in traditional, tradi- traditionally Republican segments of Metro Atlanta. What? Yeah, but overperformed. In, the, the, very true. In, very true. In rural areas. Oh, uh, why on both? Well, I mean, I think that's you know that that is the general trend in Georgia politics is that mm-hmm. the rural areas are you know much more Republican than they used to be. Used to be Democratic, right? That was the Democratic base. The base. Uh, and the the urban areas, uh, by contrast, are less Republican than they used to be. That's just the natural evolution of politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think Cobb County. My own view is that the Cobb County situation was driven by never Trumpers, or you know Republicans who who were never Trumpers, like uh, the the Ted Cruz, uh, Eric Erickson. Yeah, I mean the people who just would we, not. They were Republicans, mean, but they sure. would never vote for Trump. I right. think that's what happened okay. in Cobb. Uh, I think what happened in Gwinnett is, you know, general, is, is genuine uh, part, partisan change driven by demographics. Right, right. Upcoming uh, mayor's race here in Atlanta, um, Mary, uh, Mary Norwood. Is not a Republican. Is it? Mary Norwood is an independent. Her Democratic opponents are going to try to paint her as a Republican. But I bet you that Mary Norwood over the years has been to as many Democratic meetings as some of them have. So Mary, she's an independent, and uh, I, you know I, I think she has a chance to win. Just in case any of our viewers were wondering. <laughs> Why this? We had a discussion off camera about this before. Yes. Um, but no, no. Uh, in all seriousness, there, eight years ago, um, Mary Norwood looked like she was on her way um, to becoming yeah. mayor. Um, but of course, Kasim Reed was able to, to make it into a runoff, very close election. Yep. Uh, why do you think, and if you think, that the, the results are going to be different? Um, why? Well, there were two things that happened uh, in the runoff that uh, were very important, and both of them hurt Mary. The first was uh, that uh, Kasim Reed baited her into uh, attacking the Republicans. Mm-hmm. And so there was, um, she, she, you know, went out of her way just in the heat of the campaign to say, you know, I went to a couple of Republican meetings and the people there were crazies and, you know, I never went again and blah, blah, blah. She was trying to prove sure. that she was a Republican. Sure. But in the heat of the campaign, she overdid it. So that uh, held down the Republican support for her that should have been there. Uh, and there was also a letter by uh, a number of leading Republicans, some of whom didn't even live in the city of Atlanta, that went out to Republican primary voters and said, we're for Kasim Reed. And so I think that made a difference. She only lost in the end by 700 votes. So I think that you know, kind of interaction about Republicans hurt. The other thing that hurt is, in, is frankly, that uh, the, the Reed campaign uh, bust in voters who didn't live uh, where they voted anymore. These were people who had lived in uh, Atlanta Housing uh, Authority projects that had been torn down. And so they had moved to DeKalb County or you know, someplace else, and they brought them in. Mary is convinced that the election was stolen because it was only 700 votes. And um, she, uh, but you, know, you, can't, you can't raise money for an election challenge. It's just not possible, right? Because mm-hmm. then you got to prove who voted, and then you have to prove how they would have voted if, you know, so it's just, yeah, a lot of moving parts. But, <laughs> um, but those two things 
happened uh, at the end. And uh, I, I think she's not going to make the mistake about uh, slamming the Republicans anymore. And they've put some procedures in place to, to uh, the, the county has to, to stop this uh, busing in of people who don't live there anymore to vote. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's more chance that it's an honest election uh, this time. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the key to Mary winning is to have uh, a big turnout uh, in the north side mm -hmm. and to have a strong percentage in the north side. And also to be able to hang on to a, a minority, but a decent minority, uh, in the on the south side. And the most recent poll that that I saw showed her getting 20% of the the black vote. Mm -hmm. And if she gets that, she can win the election. Uh, and the, I mean, she's very proud of this and makes the point at every uh, uh, speech she makes that. There are Mary Norwood signs in yards all over the South Side. You know, not a majority of the yards, but there are Mary Norwood signs in the yards. And there, there are two things that are significant about that. One is um, these are personal friends that she spent years cultivating, doing, doing you know, things, helping their side of town. Sure. So these are people that, that you know, this isn't just a, a passing fancy. These are people who know Mary and who, who believe in her. Um, and the other thing is, it takes a certain amount of fortitude uh, in uh, that community to put up uh, a Mary Norwood sign or some other white candidate sign and keep it there. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, the community, uh, I mean, no secret, the, the black leadership in Atlanta feels that, that the mayor's uh, position is a black position. You know, you can argue about who ought to have it, but that it ought to be a black person. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of resonance in the community. And so, you know, people get pressured. And uh, it takes a certain amount of fortitude to put her sign up and to keep it there. And so I think she, I mean, I think there's a good chance that she'll achieve the kind of support she needs. And if she gets the kind of turnout that she needs in the North Side, then I think she can win. I'm not sure she will, but I think she can. Who makes it into the runoff with Mary Norwood? Uh, well, I think Mary makes it, uh, and I think either Caesar Mitchell or uh, Keisha Lamp Spottoms. Um, Caesar Mitchell is the the the, the second running candidate now. Mm -hmm. uh, he has um, uh, a lot of people, white people and black people, that think well of him. Uh, so he's not an enemy maker in the way that Vincent Fort, for example, is. Um, so I think he might make it. I think the other person who might make it is Keisha Lance Bottoms. And the reason for that is because she's Kasim Reed's candidate. Right. There's also a governor deal, term limited. Mm -hmm. 2018 is going to be a big election. Mm -hmm. um, on the Democratic side, let's start with the Democrats. Let's offer some, some free advice or free uh, analysis. It's two Stacys. I, I, I doubt very seriously anybody else jumps into the race of, of any significance. Um, Stacey Abrams, the former minority leader, position you once held, uh, and Stacey Evans. Right. Uh, Stacey Abrams of DeKalb, Stacey Evans, Smyrna, Cobb County. Break down the dynamics of that race. So I think it's very simple. I think Stacey Evans is the almost certain winner because... Uh, the, uh, the Democratic uh, primary electorate is very heavily black. Do you mean Stacey Abrams? Stacey Abrams. I okay. Did I say Stacey you, Evans? I, I thought Stacey, I think you did. Stacey Abrams okay. is, is the almost certain winner uh, because the Democratic primary electorate is, is uh, heavily black. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think uh, for if you believe what Stacey Abrams believes, you can say she's a good candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think she's likely to win. Uh, I, Stacey Evans, I think, I noticed Roy Barnes is supporting mm -hmm. her. I, I think this is just part of Roy's continued project to try to bring back uh, South Georgia whites into the Democratic Party. And they ain't coming. You, don't, you, you think the ship has sailed? The ship has sailed. I mean, these people were Republicans for everything except state 
elections years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't need to be Democrats anymore, and they're not going to be Democrats. So that, that train's left the station. Do you think Stacey Evans or Stacey Abrams would, would at setting aside the fact, against a generic Republican candidate, who would run a, a, a stronger race, Abrams or Evans? I don't think either one of them would run a, would okay. run a strong race. Okay. I mean, they're, neither one of them are really heavyweight candidates. Sure. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday. Jason Carter wasn't a heavyweight candidate either. But Michelle Nunn was actually a pretty good candidate. I mean, she... I didn't think why, she, why would you differentiate? She had two? she had some some real life experience. Uh, I mean, it's not business experience. I think that's more valuable. She had nonprofit experience, but but she actually had done something that wasn't politics, um, and she didn't you know end up getting getting close either. So mm -hmm. so I don't and, and I don't think either one of them are gonna are as good as she was. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think I think neither one of them are really good candidates. Um, doesn't say that a landslide election caused by something else couldn't get them elected, sure, right? I mean, sure. Lester Maddox wasn't a good candidate either. We are uh, a long way off. That's but, that's, uh, but that, that's what I think. On the Republican side, um, looks like it's shaping up Casey Cagle, uh, my fellow Athenian and Episcopalian, Brian Kemp, uh, Secretary of State, a uh, couple state senators, uh, Hunter Hill and Mike Williams, mm -hmm. and a, a, another candidate just just announced they're going to hop in the race. Who is this? Clay Tippins. Who is that? That probably uh, sa says enough. Uh, I believe he's from I believe he's from North Fulton County. We we could we could look that up. Don't know. Uh, but but sort of an outsider she wants mm -hmm. to wants to seize the outsider mantle. So mm -hmm. Sort of the way that, that David Perdue was able to cast himself as mm -hmm. an outsider. Where do you see the state of the, the Republican? I, I think it's. I think. And it's again, wide we are. Open. We're very. I think know. it's wide open. I, I don't. So you so you don't, you don't subscribe to the Casey Cagle is way out in the polls, or do you think that's just simply name recognition of a he, guy who's been on the ballot since? 06? I, I think it's name recognition, yeah. uh, and I, I I mean I'm not saying anything bad about Kay, Casey, but I think sure. it's. I think it's just at this point it is name recognition, mm -hmm. and I think it's a completely wide open race. Well, I think David Schaefer is going to win the lieutenant governor race. <laughs> well, that that that's that, I guess that's uh, an issue if we go back to 2010 with the, with the governor's race. You know, if we were talking in 2000 this time in 2000, uh, not 2010, but obviously the year before 2009. Who would be governor? We would say, you know, well, John Ox and John Dine is way, way ahead in the polls yeah. and stuff. You know, what do you, what do you think that are, are there going to be issues, personalities that these these races pivot on? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, there's. Um, it's really unfair for me to do this, but since I have you, no, here, I'm well, I'm saying it's 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 unknown. It depends on on things that happen, mm -hmm. and it depends on the way they run their campaigns. There's there's. I think I'm right in saying this. There's only been one primary um, of the majority party, mm -hmm. so that would be Democrats, you know, before 2000 and Republican since. There's only been one primary where the order of finish uh, was exactly the way it was predicted in the first polls, and that was 1990. No. Now, and so yeah. Zell Miller was supposed to finish first. He did. Andrew Young was Andrew supposed Young to finish second. Right. He did. Roy Barnes was supposed to finish first. Third, he did. Now you can say this is actually a, a criticism of Roy Barnes's campaign because he was the only candidate that didn't move. Right? Every other election, somebody has moved. Somebody who was not the original front runner right. uh, has emerged to be uh, the candidate. Now that doesn't mean that I think that Casey Cagle is going to lose because I don't really think Casey is a solid front runner. I think it's wide open. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you said, in, in 2010, you would have thought John Oxendine would, would be the nominee, and he finished, what, fourth, I think? I think he finished fourth. Right, because there, Eric Johnson, I think, was very close third, yeah. um, and then John Oxendine. Yeah. How did the Democrats make a comeback? It's been 15 years since, since a Democrat has been governor, uh, 13 or so since they've, they've held a legislature. Uh, a, le a chamber of the legislature. Yeah. Are we in a permanent Republican majority? 
Um, nothing's permanent, right? Uh, uh, Larry, o Larry, who was the Kennedy advisor? Not Larry O'Donnell, but... Uh, uh, um, Kenny O'Donnell. No, not Kenny O'Donnell. Larry, uh, who was the guy that became the NBA commissioner? Larry something. Um, anyway, he wrote a book one time Larry O'Brien. Larry O'Brien. He wrote a book called No Permanent Victories. Uh, and I think that's the way politics is. It's, it's, it's nothing's forever. Um, so what do the Democrats uh, have to do? I mean, it, you know, I don't mean to be cute by saying this. They have to do what we did. They have to, to find issues that resonate with the majority of uh, the population. Mm -hmm. They have to uh, put those uh, issues forth with you know, analysis and good policy proposals. They have to force votes in the legislature. They have to build a real party apparatus. They have to recruit uh, candidates in places where they have a chance to win but aren't winning. I mean, we used to say we lose more races on qualifying day than we lose on election day because we weren't recruiting quality candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and they need to do all of that. So, I, you know, I don't mean to be cute, but they need to do what we did. The Republican Party has a, a deep bench of veterans now. Um, unlike 1970s when you mm -hmm. were involved, where it was you and you know f five people in the Senate. Mm -hmm. and, you know, who are some of the up-and-coming Republicans that maybe people who don't you know, live and breathe Georgia politics are going to you know, know about in the next few years? You know, it's, it's hard to say because um, there, are, there are a lot of people, I think, who have the potential uh, to grow, and you just have to see who does. What's the Republican Party look like in 10 to 20 years, the Georgia Republican Party? Well, what I hope the Georgia Republican Party looks like is a, a, a party that is uh, uh, up to date in delivering the kind of uh, policy solutions that the people of the state need in 10 to 20 years. Uh, that's, you know, a little vague, but I don't think it's possible to know exactly what what the state will need in 10 to 20 years. So, so I mean, I hope the party is uh, honest and visionary and uh, fact and analysis driven mm -hmm. uh, and hardworking. And, um, you know, if, if we're all those things, then I think we'll still be the majority party. Anything else we didn't touch on? No, it's been... We've we so, we sort of been, you know, from one end to the other. Yeah, it's been, been fun. Thank you for... Well, thank you for, for participating. The, Happy to the, do it. The Two Party Georgia Oral History Program. Mm -hmm. um, it's been great, been very exciting uh, to talk politics for an afternoon.